On the phone, we have Pro Football Hall of Famer, the first true kicker to be inducted into Pro Football Hall of Fame, former Chief, Packer, Viking, Jan Stenerud. How are you doing today, Jan? That's great. Thank you. How about you? Good. Congratulations on uh, going back to your college at Montana State and bringing your <laughs> bus there with the Hall of Fame. Well, uh, I guess you found out. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, it was a surprise. I guess it was a program that was started a few months ago, maybe a year ago. And from what I gather, I'm going back to every Hall of Famer's hometown and uh, and doing something for them in, the ho- in their hometown. And my hometown in Fetzer, Norway, <laughs> and this program is sponsored by the Pro Football Hall of Fame in Allstate, and that just didn't make sense to do it in a place where Allstate does not exist, obviously. So... So I had the, uh, uh, a, a choice to make, and it was pretty easy. Bozeman, Montana is my adopted hometown. That's where my football career started, 50 years ago almost. <laughs> and uh, so it was, a, it, was a, it was a really meaningful day for me. How does a guy get a ski jumping scholarship to go to well, Montana State when you're growing up in Norway? Well, I really don't know how many. Nowadays, you don't have ski jumping in the NCAAs. I think in 1962, when I got to Montana State, I'm guessing between 45 and 50 schools in the United States had, had the ski teams. And ski jumping, I, ski jumping was my specialty, but we had to do two things. So I did cross-country skiing as well, but jumping is what I enjoyed. I think they discontinued ski jumping in the NCAAs in the early 70s. I think I heard some talk it might be coming back, but you don't have enough facilities. By the way, in Chicago, they have a hill called Norge, N-O-R-G-E, Norge Hill. It was a windy little jumping hill. We jumped in the the mid-60s, I remember. But what happened was I finished sixth in the junior nationals in ski jumping in Norway in 1962, and uh, a guy at Montana State who were already there on the ski scholarship, he had a newspaper clipping, and he showed it to the to the ski coach and the next thing i know i get a get a letter in the mail offering me a full uh, full ride ski scholarship and i thought it'd be a neat experience to come to the greatest place on earth and uh, take it from there my plan was just to go for one year and see how i liked it usually when they discover kickers they usually discover them playing soccer how did you get discovered well, I did play soccer. That was my summer sport. And I was I played on teams since I was eight years old. And I was a pretty decent soccer player. Uh, and I always would take the corner kick and the free kick because I could kick the ball pretty hard for some reason, which doesn't necessarily make you a great soccer player. But the ski team, they always... Uh, so I didn't play any soccer. I, I didn't kick any kind of ball for two or three years off at Montana State. But as a ski a skier, we ran the stadium steps every single day, it seemed like. And one day, one guy, Dale Jackson, he was a backup kicker on the football team. and was also a safety, and his shoulder was hurt. So I went down and kicked a few footballs with him. My, uh, end of my, oh, actually, fall my junior year. Kicked with a toe like everybody else kicked in those days. And after, after a few attempts, I asked, uh, asked him, I said, could you kick with the side of your foot like you take a corner kick in soccer? He said, yes, you can. There's a guy for the Buffalo Bills. His name is Pete Gogolak. He kicks with the side of his foot. And, of course, I'd never seen him. I wasn't that interested in football. So I started kicking a few. And uh, I did that, oh, I guess once a week or so. And one day the basketball coach, Roger Kraft, walks across the football field on the way to his office. And he sees me, and he takes a second look. And he said, so he ran over to the football coach, Jim Sweeney, who later became uh, won 200 games at Fresno State. But he was the coach at Montana State. He finally took a look at me and uh, it made me uh, try out for spring practice, and uh, my senior year in college, they changed my scholarship from uh, from skiing to football, although I did both sports my senior year. And at the end of that year, I was drafted by the Kansas City Chiefs uh, in the third round of what they call the AFL redshirt draft. So after about 13 attempts and three of them over 60 yards, I was drafted. That probably wouldn't happen these days. Now, the Chiefs drafted you in what was, I think, called the Futures Draft. And then in, yeah, the, in, in, yeah, the Futures Draft, the, the AFL Redshirt Draft was another okay. name for it, yeah. Okay. Now, is that, in 67, the NFL and AFL went to a joint draft. Did the Chiefs hold, still hold your rights? Well, what happened was I, was I was drafted after the 65 season because that was my senior year. So there was about 25 to 30 of us that were drafted in the AFL future draft or the redshirt draft. And I'd get quarter system at Montana State then, so I decided to keep seven credits so I wouldn't graduate that next spring. So I went to uh, what could be on the football team in 1966 and then graduated at, at Christmas time 
uh, after that season. And the NFL had a special draft of the 25 or so AFL future draft choices from the year before. It gets a little bit complicated. And Atlanta was the first one to have a pick of those 25 AFL future draft choices. And that was the first one to be picked. So now it was a choice between Atlanta, who was brand new in the NFL. They had one year in the league at that time. And, of course, some people still call the AFL the Mickey Mouse League. So it was a choice to make between Atlanta Falcons or the NFL or the Kansas City Chiefs or the AFL. This was before Super Bowl won when I had to make this choice. And, and uh, Bobby Bathard later became, of course, the GM for the Redskins and the, and the San Diego. He was a scout in Kansas City. I really liked him. A guy called Tommy O'Boyle who was the head talent scout. And, of course, Hank Strand, very convincing. So I chose Kansas City, and I was a rookie there in 67. When you joined the Chiefs, then you ended up going to the Super Bowl again in Super Bowl Four. What was that Super Bowl like for you? Well, but they had just finished. Uh, the, the year before the Chiefs had played Super Bowl One against the Packers and lost 35-10, all of us 14-10 at halftime. Of course, the Packers won pretty convincingly again. The Super Bowl Two against the Raiders and Super Bowl Three, of course, is one of the most famous of all times. When the Jets of the AFL beat Baltimore 16-7, to and our Super Bowl game, Super Bowl IV, was the last game to truly played between the two leagues before the mergers. And the Vikings were 14, 13, 14 points underdogs, and we ended up winning 23-7. And it was a huge deal for us. I get asked now, was the Super Bowl a big deal, you know, 43 years ago? We thought it was. It's not like it is now, but still, at that time, it was becoming the biggest sporting event in America. We thought it was huge. It was a really big deal then, too. And in that Super Bowl, you kicked a 48-yarder, a 32-yarder, a 25-yarder, and the, the Chiefs were up 9 to nothing. And Are you thinking to yourself, I'm going to have to score all the points today? <laughs> no, but that season, you know, nowadays... During that season, I was a great quarterback, Larry Dawson, was hurt in the second game, first or second game. Backup was Jackie Lee. He got hurt after a few series of play. And number third string quarterback, Mike Livingston, came in. And we won six games in a row with him as a quarterback. Now, the game has changed a little bit. It doesn't seem like you can win now if you only run the football. We, ran it, we mainly ran the ball. We had a great defensive team, low-scoring games, and we won a lot of low-scoring games. A pretty good kicking team. Gerald Wilson was a great, great punter for us, and I was known as a pretty good kicker in those days. And, and we won six games without uh, our number one or two quarterback. And, and we ran the ball quite a bit, great defense. But, no, I wasn't really concerned about that. Uh, it looked like it was going to be the fourth attempt right before the end of the half. But on third and five, Mike Garrett scored. It is 16 nothing, and uh, and we needed that. And uh, the only thing I thought about Super Bowl was, please let us win. I don't care how I do personally, as long as we win. There's nothing worse than lose to the, the Super Bowl. Everybody makes a big to do about the halftime entertainment now at the Super Bowl. Do you remember who the halftime entertainment was in Super Bowl four? Yeah, of course, we're in the locker room. <laughs> so I, but, but I remember. I think it was Doc Severinsen and Al Hurt. Doc Severinsen played the trumpet, you know, on the on Tonight Show for a long time after Skip Henderson had been there for a while, and then it was Al Hurt is from from New Orleans, and and what I, what I remember is I'm not. It seemed like we were leading 16 nothing against a team that was heavily favored, the Vikings. So it seemed to me like the Super Bowl halftime took forever. We couldn't wait to get out there. We, we didn't want to lose any momentum. So what I remember the most was just how long it took to get back out again. You're right, Doc Severinsen did the national anthem. And the other, uh, with Pat O'Brien and the halftime show, another person who was out there was Carol Channing. You know, I did not know that. I do know <laughs> that, that Pat O'Brien, there was a guy on the sideline. It was a friend of Hank's, it looked like. And this guy kept asking me if he had my warm up jacket. It was a cold, blustery day in New Orleans. And also, the tarp, it's hard to believe, there's a lot of mud on the, on the, you know, I had mud cleats on in that game because the tarp had leaked in several places. And this is the Super Bowl. It leaked it rained the night before. But this guy on, on the sideline kept asking me to get my warm-up jacket after the game. And finally, I realized it was Pat O'Brien that kept bugging me about this thing. And, and I said, you got to wait till the game is over. I said, don't, don't disturb me in case I had to go in and, and do something again. So, so he was on the sideline, but I did not know that the, the whole halftime show. I really didn't. I just, somehow over the years, I've been told that it was Doc Severinsen and Al Hurt. But I, I'm, I'm glad to know that. And as a matter of <laughs> fact, 
the halftime show, I wouldn't mind seeing a marching band, tell you the truth. And, so, <laughs> and I, I told that the other day, and one guy looked at me and says, you mean you don't like Boynsey? What, <laughs> what the heck is her name? Don't you like her? I guess most people can enjoy watching her. But the halftime show has become, you know, quite a quite a circus. And, uh, and, and it is what it is. And I guess it, it attracts a lot of viewers as well. And it's a, obviously it's a huge day and been a success too. If they would have brought, brought Carol Channing out there this year, I think a lot of people would have been upset. <laughs> you know, many, many years later, I can remember I was getting some award in New York, and I rode a, a cab with Ethel Kennedy and Carol Channing. I mean, this is the early 70s, 73, 74. It was a Kennedy Award that I got because I was involved in Special Olympics for, for many, many years, and that thing never came up. I didn't know that. I'm glad to, glad to hear that. As a kicker, did you find yourself isolated from the rest of the team? <laughs> you know, I've been asked that so many times. And, of course, keep in mind now, uh, 46 years ago, we only had one practice field. There was no other field to go and kick. And so Gerald Wilson and I, we really kicked the ball across the end zone, back and forth a little bit at the beginning of practice. Then we go over and watch practice, and if we could, uh, if we could hold the bags and help out any way we could, or even filled in on the on the punt team as a, an outside guy running down the if I needed somebody to run or whatever. So I tried to get involved as much as I could. Although obviously I could not play football on a professional level, obviously. But they had such a veteran team in Kansas City that I was accepted really well. I felt at the time I didn't have any problems at all. And they talk about the kicker, nobody speaks to him, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, the veterans in Kansas City, uh, I think maybe they appreciated my talent when I got there, and they were really. They made me feel welcome and appreciated from day one, so I had a good feeling when I was there the whole time. That Christmas Day game in 71, the divisional game against the Dolphins, is the longest game in NFL history. Did you ever think that game was going to end? Well, you know, the, the, the strange thing is that's 40, what, 41 years ago. At the time, I was bitterly, bitterly disappointed because I let the team down, and I really feel that I, was, I still feel that way. Uh, if I had a decent day, we would have won that game. And the, 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 the strange thing is the, those thoughts do not get much better over the years. Uh, but I see a young kid now miss an uh, uh, important kick in a big game, playoff game or Super Bowl. I think he doesn't know it yet. But he's going to take that to the grave with him. It really stays with you. And although I kicked, I don't know how many field goals I really kicked, and a lot of game-winning kicks too, uh, the one that sticks out is the one that you miss. And that is, that is one that bothers me a lot. And, uh, and I did not realize at the time that it would stay with you your whole lifetime uh, because you are accountable and you are a professional and you're supposed to make those kicks like that. Was Arrowhead a good stadium to kick in? So-so. It's... Uh, of course, we kicked the, the first five years that I was in with Kansas City, we kicked in the old municipal stadium. Uh, the Arrowhead, the wind comes in, there it goes in every direction. So it's, it's, it's so-so. Uh, it's certainly not like indoor by any means. But what they improve on nowadays, they keep the turf. It seems like they take more care of uh, the turf in these days versus you know, 30, 40 years ago when you see film from way back or even longer back than that. There's a lot of mud, and there's not much uh, even grass on the field. So they do a lot better job with that. But as far as wind is concerned, on a windy day, Arrowhead can be tricky. But then you go to Green Bay. I mean, it's even harder to kick in with that weather conditions up there. Well, I had my best years probably my early years and my, la my late years. In Green Bay, oh, I, get, I kicked over 90% one year. And it was difficult. And you had to adjust because you, the footing was bad, and, and it was windy, and the cold. And of course, the ball then was lying on the on the on the, on the sideline in the bag for three hours at the end of the game. That, that ball wouldn't go very far. It isn't like they do now. They have warm up nets, and you warm the ball up, and you do you do certain things. It was difficult, but I had good luck up there. And of course, the kicking has become so much better. And even in my years at Green Bay, I think I kicked over 80 percent the four short seasons I, w I was there. And I wasn't nearly as talented as I was 15 years earlier. But we started to get special teams coaches. The most important thing, we got the reps, a few reps in during the week. And we started to break in maybe the punter as a holder. So we got more reps, and uh, we didn't have a snapper yet, but uh, we got more reps. That was a big big thing for me, I think. There's sometime early in my career, I may have even tried the field goal attempt at a center and a holder harder during the week. 
Now, when you went to Green Bay, you had to change your number because Tony Canadeo's number three had been retired. <laughs> Was that dramatic, having to shift your jersey number? No, I have to say, guys, that you are better researched and better informed than anybody I think I ever talked to. And you're absolutely <laughs> right. Number three was retired. Tony Kennedy, a great running back in the late 30s, 40s. His number was retired, so I had to make another choice. And that was number 10. Uh, seemed to be an okay number to have. <laughs> that didn't bother me. I just respected very much that the number was retired at Tony Kennedy. And then it turns out that my number in Kansas City is retired. Um, but then I went to Minnesota with Forrest Gregg. Bart Starr was fired after an eight and eight season where we scored that season we scored over forty games in a lot of in a lot of games. We had a tremendous offensive team and a lot of injuries on defense. The fourth great trade made to Minnesota, number three was available there, so I had number three there for my last two years uh, in my career. What was your favorite stadium to kick in? Well, there's no question that if you listen, if you kick indoor when it's sixty eight degrees and no wind, perfect footing so basically, you have to say every indoor stadium is the best place to kick. And you got a pretty good pen. You got a pretty good pension there, being what eighteen years in the league, seventeen years in the league. No, nine, nineteen. I'm not going to give you the exact numbers, but you know, if you <laughs> much as much as you do, you can figure that out. Now, there's been a lot of talk about the pension. The pension compared to baseball, and, and, and for example, it's it's not good at all compared to what uh, football is the most profitable league there is. There's been a lot of complaints about the former players. Now, mine is good because you get paid. It goes up per year. And I was one of the few players that waited till I was 65 years old, and it goes up dramatically between, let's say, 55 and 65. It goes up 2.6 times, almost three times. And also a lot of guys take it at 45, 47. And, of course, the average career in the NFL is 3.9 years, so they didn't have four years to qualify. So for most people, that uh, unless you're a good enough kicker to last in the league for a long time or a backup quarterback or whatever, you're not going to have a good pension in the NFL. It's such a profitable league. So that's a sore subject in a few people's cases. It's okay because you were lucky to be there a long time and you maybe worked and made good enough income in the off season in the, in the, in the, the thing you did after football that you could wait. But... Uh, uh, compared to, to to baseball, it is uh, it really is for for most retired players, it is it's sad. Did you have a favorite holder, a favorite center? Well, uh, in the early days, I said that the best center was usually the one that was a backup center in training camp, and then he got cut the last day of the, <laughs> the last cut before the season. And now you get thrown in with a new center on, on Tuesday or Wednesday, four or five days before the first game. Uh, that happened if many years that I was in the league, but also for a while I had Bobby Bell as a center. And Bobby Bell could do anything. He was a Hall of Fame linebacker. He won the Outland Trophy at Minnesota University as a college player. He was a quarterback in, in high school in Shelby, North Carolina. So he was a good snapper. And Lenny Dawson was a great holder. Uh, and, and keep in mind, he didn't really practice it because we didn't have time to practice it. They, they played other positions. So we just took, after training camp, we just took a few snaps after practice. Um, and then when I uh, broke in Bucky Scribner, I remember up in Green Bay, he was the punter. And, and Ray Stackowitz was the punter. And later, Greg Coleman in Minnesota, they were punters. I just underhanded, threw the ball to them over and over and over again so they could practice, you know, catching the ball, spinning it if they needed to, and put it down. So that became very good. But, but Lenny, with very little practice, had great hands, and he, could, he did that extremely well. But we had some, you know, shaky times uh, several years because you didn't have a, you know, a snapper or, 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 or a holder, so to speak. You played for several Hall of Fame uh, coaches and players who went on the coach, went in the Hall of Fame. You had, what, Hank Stram, Forrest Gregg, Bart Starr. And did you also have Mar Bud, Bud Grant, too? Yep. I did Bart. I mean, uh, uh, Hank Stram. Uh, it, I just loved Hank Stram. He gave me the opportunity. Like when I was drafted, I had just a few field goal attempts, and he made me think that I was going. That I was very good. He, he gave me a lot of confidence. Uh, he came out uh, before my training camp, my rookie year. He came to the practice field, and he was kneeling down, holding the ball for me a couple of times a week there, a uh, month before training camp, and then the three weeks before training camp, two weeks before. He wanted to find out, you know, if he could see something that he could help me with. He was just terrific. Plus, he was such an, 
optimistic, positive person. I enjoyed him a lot. Uh, of course, I had a lot of good coaches. Bart Starr was a, there's no better person than a Bart Starr. When he was fired in Green Bay, I thought, you don't fire a person like Green Bay, like Bart Starr. And he had a pretty good uh, season, a pretty good coaching job up there, too. There too. We went to the uh, playoffs in the strike shortened season in 1990, or 82, rather, and then we were 8-8 eight and eight in 83. And if he had had one more year, to get the defense chored up a little bit, I think he could have he could have done real well. I did not play for Forrest Gregg. He's someone that traded me to Minnesota. Les Deco was there the first year, and Les was ridiculed a lot, but I, I, Les was okay. Uh, they find a way to make fun out of him a lot, but Les was okay. But Bud Grant was also an amazing coach. He, uh, he didn't tolerate mistakes. He didn't say much, but when he spoke up, everybody listened. I guarantee you that. And I, I bet you Minnesota won so many games when the other team had 400 yards of total offense and the, the Vikings maybe 275, but no turnovers and very few mistakes, so they won ball games. And uh, he was just an outstanding coach as well. So uh, so I was very fortunate. And other people in between, uh, and all good coaches, actually. They, they, all, they all pretty darn good on that level. And, and, the, and the talent, uh, you know, I think the coaches have, frankly, uh, fairly equal on that level. And so are the players, but still, you know, uh, if you're lucky, you have a great talent and you have some breaks. And, and uh, But there are coaches now like Belichick in New England, for example, it seemed like, uh, he, you know, they're somewhat better than others, but most of them do the same thing. Most teams do the same thing. So so the, the, the difference between a bad and a good coach and a bad and a good player in that league is not very much. How were you able to avoid injury over the course of your career? <laughs> well, keeping my eyes open on the kickoffs, had my head on the swivels, I wouldn't get hit when somebody came right after me, I suppose. <laughs> um, I remember one time after, a, uh, early on, they would send a, kick, send a guy right after you because he kicked on the 40-yard line. And the first couple of years, so a few, few years, I would kick the ball out of the end zone most of the time. And there were some times that somebody would come right after you. But I, was, I could run pretty fast. I was pretty quick on my feet, so I, I avoided that. Uh, I did get hurt one time in Cleveland. I broke my sternum, actually. It was a, on the kickoff after safety, and after I mean, punter was hurt, so we had to kick off on the 20-yard line, and, and somebody had to hold the ball. To, Emma Thomas actually held the ball for me over all of and defensive back, and, and uh, I think it was Greg Pruitt that ran it back, and I was able to hang on to then make a tackle somehow about midfield, and one of my own teammates hit me in the back of the head, and that was the only time I really got hurt. And I, I, I never had a pulled muscle. I obviously had the flu and the cold and things like that from time to time, but uh, I never missed the game, so I was fortunate that way. Did you expect to go in the Hall of Fame? I hadn't even thought. I didn't even know that. you got to keep in mind, when I got to Montana State, for example, does that mean you can get a scholarship for just kicking the football? And then they told me about the pros. You know, you're kicking the ball further than the people that see on television. And they told me you can actually get paid for just kicking the football. And I thought that was amazing. Then I got into the league and said, you can get a pension if you play for five years. <laughs> now, when I got nominated in 1991, two or three weeks before the Super Bowl, I get a, um, been out of the league for five years, I get a regist registered letter from the Hall of Fame, and it's a, you're one of the 15 finalists. Now it's 17, I believe. 15 finalists for the Hall of Fame. Let us know where you're going to be at such and such time the day before the Super Bowl. And I saw the names on the list there, on that 15 finalists. And as far as I knew, no kicker ever, or a person that couldn't do anything else but kick, had ever been a finalist. So I didn't know what to think of it. And, it, 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 and I was su surprised in some way because I hadn't, that wasn't anything that uh, had really come up because... Uh, you heard it on television sometime, though, once, uh, maybe announced in my 17, 18, 19th year, we said future Hall of Famer, and I thought, well, that's, that's special a little bit. So, Anyway, I got in the first year. I, I'm not one of those people, obviously, because nobody had been in that position before. So I, I didn't give that much of a thought. I really didn't. It was a, it was a very exciting, very pleasant, surprising uh, thing, and I'm, I'm, I feel as lucky as anybody can be. And you're the only true kicker or punter in there, I think. At this point, I am, yes. I know that Ray Guy has been a finalist many times. I really expected, let's face it, there are not going to be too many kickers in the Hall of Fame. You can see that now. Uh, I guess you guessed that years ago. 
uh, I guess I'm the only special teams player or kicker in the Hall of Fame, but I thought that the Morton Anderson uh, would get in this year. When I got in, I had the most field goals in history of the league. I had six Pro Bowls. I think I was all pro for various uh, papers or whatever seven times. And Morton had the same credentials, except he also was a leading scorer. I was the second leading scorer. I never caught the blanda. And of the Pro Bowls in all league years were similar. And I thought that he did not get in, and I, I know he was disappointed. I, uh, uh, but I think he will get in. I think he deserves to get in. And other names that comes up, I think Ben Vinatieri, if he continues, well, he's had a long career already. He has won, made some of the biggest games on the biggest stage in the game, and I think he would be a, a strong candidate. But I hope Morton get, get in there soon. And Janikowski, I think, has got a good chance, too. Well, the way, yeah. Of course, his story is, you know, he's not halfway through the, uh, you know, his, his, his uh, story is not even half written yet, probably. But you're right. When you were inducted and you looked out at the crowd, what, what goes through your mind? <laughs> oh, boy. I don't know. I had, uh, let's see. Uh... I don't know for sure. I, I, you feel like you, you feel like you, you, you don't deserve to be there when you see all the names and all the people you read about. But 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 the strange thing is, I meet other people later. My mind is automatic first time Hall of Famer. They will even tell you that they don't, don't really feel like they belong there. So you feel very humble and uh, and very appreciative. But I just wonder if it's really true. And uh, I didn't go back for 10 years. Uh, uh, I didn't really see any point in it. But then I had a 10-year reunion. Uh, it's almost like you go there to get applause, I suppose, for that matter, if you go all the time. But after 10-year reunion, I enjoyed it very much. And uh, I, now they try to bring most people back every year. So, so it's very special. At the, but when you go back to 1991, I thought, of my, I thought a lot about my teammates, my teammates in college, my coach in college, Jim Sweeney, who gave me the opportunity, uh, the coaches I had, the, the, the teammates I had, my family, my parents, and uh, all the stuff that uh, that added uh, that was a factor. Uh, you know, I was I could do. It wasn't like I just stepped on the field and kicked one day. I had we had a, in my backyard in Norway. We always had played soccer and we had a goal in the backyard, and I would stay out. We all played and kicked the soccer ball, you know, a thousand times a day, it seemed like. So uh, so even though that, I didn't realize that you could make a living kicking a ball at that time. It wasn't like I'd never kicked any kind of a ball before. I'd, I'd kicked the ball a million times before I started kicking the football. But it's it's a uh, kind of a fairy tale story in some ways. And and uh, it's, it's, it's funny how it works out at times. But I'm, I'm very appreciative of the way it worked out for me.